Welcome to Cornerstone, week 21 of Cornerstone's One House Bible in a Year series continues right now. This week, we're going to be getting into the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And by the time we're done with this week's readings, we will be at the end of the Old Testament timeline. Um, there's one more history book to go in Esther, but Esther actually takes place between Second Chronicles and Ezra. So the timeline itself ends at the end of Nehemiah. After that, we'll be heading into the poetry books and then the prophets. Um, but the Old Testament narrative, as we'll see this week, ends on a very hopeful note. Also, almost everyone agrees that Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. Our Jewish friends still see them as a single book. We don't know why they were split into two books, but they are. They're a single story. So I want you to note one really interesting thing about this before we get into it. When they left 70 years ago, when they were taken into captivity 70 years before Ezra and Nehemiah, they had been called Israelites for most of their history. When they come back for the first time ever, you're going to see a new word. They're going to be called the Jews. Ezra 4.23 is the first time that the word Jew is used in the entire Bible. So the words Jew, Jews, and Jewish appear about 300 times in Scripture, but not one time before Ezra, which is the end of the Old Testament narrative. So why is that? Why are they now called Jews? Well, it goes back to Judea. If you'll remember, at the end of the time before the, um, well, the last several, several centuries, actually, before the exile, the nation had been split into two kingdoms called Israel to the north and Judea to the south. And Judea was the last of the two to be exiled to fall when Jerusalem fell. At that point on, we don't exactly know why, but from that point on, it became fairly common to call them not Israelites, but Jews. And so for the rest of the Bible, both those terms will be used, but Jew will be the most common term used for God's people from this point on. But this week's reading in Ezra chapter 4 will be the first time we will read that. So let's get into it. First of all, in Ezra chapters 1 and 2, we know when these events took place, like exactly, and here's why. Ezra 1.1 says, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, we know from historical records that this was 538 BC. Now, when you read Ezra chapters one, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it's going to be a bit of a deja vu, and here's why. If you flip one page back in your Bible, you're going to see that the last the two verses of Second Chronicles are virtually identical to the first two verses of Ezra. They take place 70 years apart, but this parallel of verses tells us that it's a continuation of that story. So what you have is they've been in exile for 70 years, and then the king allows them to start going home if they want to go home. Why would the king who exiled them allow them to go home? Well, because 70 years later, it's not the same king who exiled them. In fact, it's not even the same kingdom. Since Cyrus of since, since they were um, since they were taken sorry about that since they were taken into captivity by Babylon and actually Assyria before that they now have been conquered by Persia and Cyrus is the king and basically Cyrus looks around and goes I don't care if these people are slaves or not they've basically been integrated into their culture if they want to go home they can go home after all I rule over Israel as well so who cares. So he lets them go home and they slowly start to go back home again. In Ezra chapter three, some of them get home with the first wave and they get started with priority number one, which is to honor God by rebuilding the altar and by rebuilding the temple. Now, we need to be really careful in drawing parallels here. You'll see they get back, they want to honor God, they rebuild the physical temple, they rebuild the physical altar. It's really easy for us as Christians to take that parallel and go, well, that means that we should respect the church building. Now, yes, we should respect the church building, but here's the deal. The New Testament parallel, today's parallel to the Old Testament temple, is not our church buildings. Don't look at the Old Testament temple and go, however, however they treated the temple, we should treat our church building. That's not the parallel. The parallel to the Old Testament temple is our New Testament bodies, our physical bodies, individually and when we gather. The New Testament is really clear about that, and we'll get to that when we start reading the New Testament. The Bible tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are to honor God in our bodies, that God no longer dwells in a physical place built of, of, of brick and, and stone and wood, but he dwells within 
the, the hearts are our, our fleshly hearts within within our actual bodies. So when we see them treating the Old Testament temple well, that tells us how we are to treat ourselves as God's people, both individual and gathered. How do I behave in my body? How do I honor God and honor others in my body? That is honoring God's temple. How do I treat the assembly of God's people when we meet together, whether it's in a church building or a coffee shop or in a house, it doesn't matter where, the building isn't the point. The point is the people. The people are the temple today. Back then, it was a physical place. So back then, first thing they wanted to do was to invite God back into their presence again. Back then, the way they had to do it was to build the temple and the altar because God was present when they offered sacrifices on the altar at the temple. But Ezra 4 and 5 tells us that no work of God happens without opposition. We'll see more opposition in Nehemiah when they start building the wall, but immediately there is opposition to the people building the wall. In chapter 5, we're going to see two prophets step up, namely Haggai and Zechariah. Yes, the same Haggai and Zechariah of the books that we will be reading in chapter 40 at the end of the Old Testament. This is when they lived. Then in chapter 6, the temple is built and they celebrate the Passover. This is for the first time in a long, long time. Darius of Persia comes along and he actually has to tell people, yes, they're allowed to do this. And that kind of silences the opposition for a while. And who's Darius of Persia? Wasn't it Cyrus of Persia that we had? Yes, this is how much time has passed that kings have changed. Later, we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to see Xerxes. By the time this is done, we're going to see Artaxerxes as well. Why? Because a lot of time passes, and we'll go over some of that. But the kings constantly change because the time is a long period of time. Well, they, they finish the temple. They celebrate Passover then for the first time in at least 70 years. And I say at least 70 years because, well, they've been exiled for 70 years. The temple has been destroyed for 70 years. But the reason the temple was destroyed, the reason they were sent into exile is because they hadn't been obeying God for a long period of time. It may have been decades before that that they hadn't been doing Passover as well. We don't know for sure. But in chapter 6, we see Passover the first time in at least 70 years. Then finally, in chapter 7, verse 1, we meet someone for the first time, Ezra. That's right. We go through six chapters of the book of Ezra before meeting the man, Ezra. He finally shows up, and he shows up in 458 BC. Again, you'll read in there, it tells us not just the year, but the month and the day that he shows up. And it's 80 years after Ezra 1, when the first group started to go in. That's how much time has passed it, okay? It's been several kings later. It's been 57 years since they completed building the temple. So people started showing up 80 years ago. They finished the temple 57 years ago, and Ezra shows up then in chapter 7, verse 1. It's a long, long time. He shows up with a letter from the king. He shows up with money from the king. This time it's the king Artaxerxes. And he's shown, he, he, he's given permission to tax the people around him to do further building of Jerusalem. Again, this is 80 years after the original exile started to come back, or 150 years after the exile first happened. It's a long period of time. He gets back in Ezra 10, 9 through 10, and when he looks around, he discovers that the people have been intermarrying with pagans and worshiping idols in the 57 years since they finished the building of the temple. He calls them to repent, and thankfully, they do. Now, the wall is still down. It's been down now for 150 years since it fell originally, and the temple is now in disrepair. It's been 57 years since it was built, and in the intervening decades, they've been worshiping as pagans, and they've been worshiping idols and ignoring the temple so that there are weeds growing up through the cracks. And so he calls them to repentance they do repent and they say, we're going to do better from now on. That's where Ezra ends. And then Nehemiah picks up with Nehemiah 1 and 2, the man named Nehemiah. Now, we first meet Nehemiah, not in Israel. He's not there yet. But we meet him because he's the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon. And he looks sad one day. And the king asks him, why are you sad? You're usually so happy. And he says, I've just heard report back that Jerusalem is in ruins. It's my hometown from generations ago. Like, it's a long way back, right? But he says, I'm really feeling sad that it is in such bad shape. And the king gives him permission to go back to assist in the rebuilding of it. He sends money with him, and he sends him permission to rebuild and to tax the people in order to get it done. So he shows up in cha chapter 3, and in chapter 3, verse 7, you've got the great story of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall. 
I want you to note a couple of things through this because there are a couple of chapters in three through seven where it's this person built this person, this one, and this person built that, and it can feel a little boring, slow. So let me give you a couple of things to look for that will really bring it to life for you. Notice how everyone was involved in the building of the wall. You've got builders, but you've also got goldsmiths and perfumers and women and children and people who don't even live there. Take a look at the variety of people who simply stepped up and said, the job's got to be done. It is actually one of the great collaborative moments of the entire Old Testament. It's the reason why pastors often use Ezra and Nehemiah, especially Nehemiah in this segment, in sermons about how to work as a team in the church. Everybody steps up and everybody contributes. But there is opposition, as there always is when we're following God. And the opposition in this season gets so bad that the Bible tells us they had to finish the job with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. It is finished, however, and by Nehemiah 8 through 10, Ezra calls the people to repentance. He reads the law. They recognize their sin. They repent and they pledge to be better. And from this point on, idolatry and paganism really never becomes an issue for the Jews again. By the time of Jesus, They've actually swung the pendulum far, so far to the other side that instead of paganism and idolatry, they swung it all the way over to legalism, and that's the argument that Jesus has with them. Both legalism on one hand and paganism on the other hand are extremes that we should never fall into. But idolatry is really never an issue for the Jews again after this point. And then we conclude Nehemiah with chapters 11 through 13, where after some counting of the temple workers and some of the families, the Old Testament narrative ends with these beautiful words, remember me with favor, oh my God, in Nehemiah 3, 13, verse 31. If the Old Testament was purely chronological, this would be the second to last book with only Malachi after it. So Malachi is chronologically placed as the last book of the Bible, but this is right before Malachi chronologically. Now, remember that as we continue, because uh, after this, from Esther and the Psalms and the books of wisdom and the prophets, they everything after this point takes place before this point. And as we go through, we'll point that out to you, we'll remind you of it, so you're aware of what we're dipping back into in the chronology. But as we finish up, here are a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, remember that this all happens after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Uh, some of that we'll also see later on the captivity in Babylon itself in the book of Daniel. You'll notice that this is the end story of the Old Testament. This is where this Old Testament narrative ends. Uh, you'll notice that they they will learn their anti-idolatry lesson and they'll never fall back into the, that again, but they will have problems with legalism later on. But mostly as you're reading this week, take a look at what happens when God's people cooperate under a God-given plan. When we hear from God, when we obey God, and when we all pitch in together to follow what God has called us to do, amazing things happen. All right, enjoy the reading this week. There's great stuff. We'll see you next week.